who, okay, functional programming is a lot like uh, your standard imperative programming that probably most of us have either learned in college or taught ourselves or been taught at Dev Mountain. JavaScript is an imperative, object-oriented programming language. Elm is a functional, object-oriented programming language. Functional typically means that functions, okay, well, here's the other thing. JavaScript is also has many, many functional attributes. And you can tell because in JavaScript, have any of you ever taken a function and passed it as an argument to another function? If you have, raise your hand. I bet you all of you have because you've used callbacks. Callbacks take advantage of what are called higher order functions to pass functions in to other functions. Turns out this is a really useful practice. And it's so useful, in fact, that entire languages have been designed around this very concept. And some of these languages you may have heard of. In fact, some of these languages are many, many, many years older than most of the languages that we use in our normal pr programming today. If you've heard of Lisp, Lisp is a functional programming language. If you've heard of Clojure, Clojure is a functional programming language. If you've heard of, wow, Haskell. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second. Haskell is a functional programming language. There are... There's a lot of theory associated with functional programming languages, usually, because usually the people who use functional programming languages up to this point are very academic. So it can be a little intimidating to jump into the world of functional programming, because even though there are advantages, there's a lot of cognitive overhead a lot of times to understanding the concepts that are taught, because the people who are inventing these languages are very, very smart, and they like to talk about the things that they figure out. Okay, So um, today we're going to talk about Elm, and it's particularly Elm because the, people, the person who has made Elm has made special effort to make it understandable to people who are like me, <laughs> people who don't have a PhD in math, right? Um, and I found it to be a pretty easy language to pick up and also a very beneficial language to pick up. We're going to talk about some of the concepts that come along with the language in a minute. But as an introduction, Elm compiles down to normal JavaScript, ECMAScript 5. So ECMAScript 6 has a compiler, Babel, that'll compile down to ECMAScript 5. So does Elm. Elm has a compiler that will compile Elm code to ECMAScript 5 or 3, compatible code. Um, and it's only for the front end currently. So if you're trying to use a language that'll run on Node, Elm's not your, not your cup of tea at the moment. They're targeting making a great tool for building front-end web applications. Who knows what React is? That's everybody, that's great, almost everybody. React, if you don't know, is a library for interacting with the document object model on an HTML page, right? The DOM, if you've heard of that. So React makes it really easy to interface with the DOM and, and work with it. Elm does that too. In fact, if you're going to use Elm as a language, you're not going to use React anymore. There aren't any Elm React bindings. There's a whole separate library for interacting with the DOM that comes with Elm. Turns out that it's actually really quite a pleasant experience and can be very performant, very fast, even faster than JavaScript at times. So now that I've given you the spiel about the language, there's my name, Murphy Randall. I work with Jameson at Qualico. I'm exploding socks on Twitter. And my website's murph.xyz. We're going to have, um, this is a shameless plug. I'm trying to learn more about this stuff. So there's one of the functional languages that's pretty cool called Haskell. We're starting a Utah Haskell meetup. So the first meeting is going to be at Qualico on August 20th at 7 p.m. And you're all invited. OK. Is it, be on it is not yet on meetup because my wallet isn't big enough to buy a meetup page yet. Oh, you're right. Yeah, so there is a meetup page under the organization Lambda Lounge. Yeah. Yes, and uh, so you can probably just go search for Lambda Lounge, find the meetup there. OK, let's talk about Elm. Uh, before we talk about Elm, who has ever pair programmed before? Yeah? So, like half the room? Well, you're going to pair program tonight with me, because I love pair programming. And if pair programming with one person is fantastic, <laughs> pair programming with a whole room is going to be just a wonderful experience. So if you don't, if you have a laptop, please pull it out. If you don't, don't worry about it. But I'm going to try to go, I'm going to try to be clear enough that we can all move forward with this together, program on this together. And if you don't have a laptop, just watch what I'm doing and tell me when I'm wrong, because I'm going to be wrong uh, a number of times. Not on purpose, it just happens naturally. OK, so uh, first thing to do, first thing to do is talk about Elm a little bit. There are three important parts to remember 
about Elm's methodology, okay? Three important parts, which uh, just keep them in your mind. It'll help us a lot as we move forward. We're going to be dealing with a model. This isn't going to be your standard MVC that maybe you talked about in college. And if you didn't, that's even better, because then you're not stuck with it. Okay, so a model basically just a data structure in memory that represents the data we want to show on the app. And we're going to have one data structure that represents all of the data that we want to show in our app at one time. And next, we've got the view, which is the code that declares what the view is going to look like, essentially putting together the DOM nodes appropriately. Now, you thought I was going to say controller, didn't you? No. There's the update function. An update function takes in a model, and it returns a more different model. That's all it does. Takes in a copy of a model, does something to it, and returns it. This architecture, Elm is based completely around this architecture. And it turns out that it's a really fantastic architecture for keeping things organized and keeping things uh, understandable. If you've ever read about React, there's a buzzword that comes with it. Uh, a lot of people have been writing about that your code, it's easy to reason about your code. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, easy to reason about. So it's true. It's not just a buzzword. It's true. And the same things apply to Elm. In fact, if you've learned React, you're going to find scary similarities to the things that are in Elm. And I wouldn't actually be surprised if React got a lot of its inspiration um, from structures like Elm. Elm's been around for a few years, though it's not as popular as React. OK, so you, we talked about the model, the view, and the update function. This red square is the model. The teal circle is the view. And then that triangle is the update function. And so what we're going to explain here is that we've got a model that gets fed into the view. The user interacts with the view. And the view responds to certain events, like a button click, for example, or a key press. And when it does that, it sends out a signal. It sends out a signal that's called an action. And that signal dictates to the update function what it should do to the model. So this says, all right, the user clicked a button that says, uh, <laughs> that says flash text, right? I, everyone's got a button on their website that says flash text. I do. Uh, I don't. I actually. So they, they say, OK, the user clicked the button that says flash text, right? So I'm going to go to my update function, and I'm going to say update function. The user triggered an event, and the event asked you to update the model to initiate flashing text mode. And I just made up that word because it's so special. This is initiate. So turn on flashing text mode. So the update function, maybe, will take the model and say, flashing text equal true. And then it all starts again. The view gets rendered completely over, and the new model gets passed in. React can work a lot like this, and it probably should work a lot like this. If you aren't using React this way, you might be able to gain some benefits by using React this way in your JavaScript. Um, so may I suggest that learning a little bit of Elm may up your React game quite a bit and make you more attractive to the peoples that are looking to hire you. Um, demo time. I like to draw stuff. So I've got a little demo for us called QuoteBot. And you can access it at http colon slash slash quotebot.murf.xyz. I'm going to go there now. Um, so you don't have to go if you, if you don't desire. Oh, no. See if I can do this without breaking everything. Quotebot.murf.xyz. I wanted to hook this up with Firebase so that we could all be putting stuff on the screen, but I did not have time. Quick, somebody give me a quote. I'm here. I'm here. Who said that? I do. I. Author I. There we go. I'm here from I. Yep. I'm storing my quotes for later. The funny thing is you're not actually storing anything. So this is a very trans. I mean, I have a very bad memory. So it's great. I mean, I just come back here. I'm like, hey, there are no quotes. I get to make up some new ones. Like, uh, <laughs> the one small step for mankind, one giant leap for frogs. Forks. Author Murphy. Yeah. OK, so this app is written in Elm. It's possible. It's easy. Oh, let me hear it. What? Yeah. And it's uh, dust, dusty, dead eye Myers. I love it. 
No, one param, no params. Dusty did I Myers. All right. Okay. So that's an app. Uh, we're not going to build that. I wanted to build like this whole thing with you. Then I realized it would take like three hours. And we've only got four. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so we're going to do something else instead. But I wanted to prove to you that, that this thing actually works. And if you want to go download that, you can go to my GitHub repo. Just github.com slash murphyrandall. And you can play with it right there. But instead, we're going to write an app together with our group mob programming that's called the Reversinator. And it, what it's going to do is we're going to type in some text, and it's going to print it out in reverse, which you need all the time if in your household, like mine, you say everything backwards. I don't do that either. I'm sorry. Um, so we've got a starter project here. I've got a starter project that I've set up that if you're following along, please go ahead and download it. We'll, we'll do this together. GitHub.com slash MurphyRandall slash Elm dash starter. Also, if you're starting out, you're going to want to install Elm too. So if you go to elmlang.org and you go to, oops, ex, install, install, there is an installer. If you're running a Mac or Windows or Linux, good luck. I'll see you in a day or two. OK, uh, I'm just kidding. It's probably great. Um, you can also try it in the browser. So if you, you're in luck if you're running Ubuntu or like Arch Linux or something. Just do it in the browser. OK. Um, Great, 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 great. Let's get started. Let's make this app together. And the reason I'm saying it's pair programming is because we're going to do this live because slides are boring. And uh, I also want to show you the development experience in Elm because one of the fantastic things, probably the most fantastic thing for me right now, is the, the experience of getting something wrong when you're working with Elm because the compiler is very helpful. It teaches you why you're stupid. Which is great, because it's better than knowing you're, that you're just stupid. I mean, you want to know why, so you can fix it. And the compiler is really good at helping us understand how we're not stupid, but maybe just off the mark a little bit. So I've cloned the project myself into slash temp slash elm starter. And I have already run npm install. And uh, I have already run, I will now run npm start. So the reason I set up a little project, elm is really quick to get going, except uh, there's a little bit of tooling I wanted to initiate for you already. Is that a, that's not a real word, right? I keep saying it, but it's not a real word. Yeah, it is. It is? Yeah. Okay, initiate. I guess it's. I've now appropriated it. There, that's what I've done. I've initiated. Appropriate. Okay. So <laughs> good. Thanks. Um, basically, all this project does is it's got a grunt file. It's got some modules that tells Grunt to watch and build Elm for us, compile it when we make a change. And it's doing a little bit of a server so that we can see. Let me, let me show you the file structure. Here we are. Here's the file structure. Can you read the screen? Is it too small? Yeah, kind of. Kind of too small. It's all right. Strain your eyes. It's good for them. OK, if you look at index.html, you'll see that we've got uh, just a style sheet linked in for Bootstrap to give us some basic nice styling. And uh, you, see, you see here that we're linking to a script called bundle.js. That's inside of a build folder, which is uh, imaginary, <coughs> I guess. Oh, it's get ignored. That's why you're not seeing it in the panel here on the side. But if we open up, whoa, so much stuff. Yes? Just a note for anyone who gets stuck, you have to also install a grunt CLI. <gasps> Thank you. Spicy donuts, Out, in with the save. The path? Yeah. Command shift G. If you were running Linux, you wouldn't have that problem. You'd be able to type your path everywhere, just so you know. <laughs> okay, check this out. You have no choice. That's right. So this big long file is the app code for the app we're going to write. Elm has a little bit of a runtime that it compiles and it sticks in with your code for you. So this is kind of just like Webpack, if you were doing that before. Elm go, goes ahead and it compiles your code and it sticks in a bunch of its own stuff to run. It sticks it in a file called bundle.js, because we told Grunt to do that. And then we're linking it into an HTML page here and serving that up with Grunt, OK? Um, that's, that's the infrastructure that's around here. Um, blah, blah, blah. Great. Let's get started. Let's go into the main.elm file. Um, and in fact, I want to be brave. I want to make a new file, just in case I don't remember. We're going to start out with absolutely nothing, OK? We're going to write from zero. Yeah. Murphy Randall, Randall spelled in a strange way. 
spell it like candle, but then replace the C with an R. Murphy, R-A-N-D-L-E, okay? Okay, thanks. Great, no problem. Okay, we're starting out with nothing. We're gonna write an Elm program right now. First word is module, because this is modular code. Module main where, that's all. Now that's because we're defining a module, the main module, and we're saying everything that comes after this line describes this module. Something that we're gonna learn about functional programming is that it's generally declarative, which means you're kind of just declaring the interactions and the state in your app instead of writing out lines that take into account when things are gonna happen, if that makes sense. Uh, it probably doesn't, sorry. Not a good explanation, but maybe it'll make sense someday. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna import a nice little module that's been provided called Start App, and that's been made by the creators of Elm to make silly uh, new people like us have an easy time starting the app because there are some more advanced concepts that we haven't talked about, but Elm works on this concept of signals and uh, streams and anyway, really cool stuff that gets to be abstracted if we use this Start App module. Start app. We're going to use it. Start app makes our life a little bit easier by giving us a, f a function that takes a model, a view, and an update, and it wires up that whole interaction for us that we talked about in the slides, where the model gets fed into the view, the view triggers an action, that action gets passed to the update function, and the model gets repassed into the view again. That's what start app does, okay? So we're going to say main equal, whoa, we just defined our first function in Elm. That was that easy. Main equals, that's a function, all right? Main equals start app dot start. That makes sense. Yeah, I have to keep referencing back. Okay, this inside of curly braces, this is kind of like a JavaScript object. It's called a record, but instead of saying foo bar, you say foo equal bar. Looks a little bit more like Python. So model equal model. We're gonna make a model in a second. So I'm just gonna put it there optimistically. I'm gonna call it model. Model equal model, view equal, what's a good name for a view? View. view, I love it. View equals view and update equals update. Pretty simple, pretty easy. Um, okay, another thing I forgot to mention, Elm is statically and strictly typed. Does anyone start to sweat when I say that? You shouldn't, because this isn't Java, this is a better type system which takes in algebraic types. I don't know if that's important to you, but it's pretty freaking awesome, okay? This is an extremely flexible type system that allows you to describe many more situations than many traditional statically typed languages do. And you'll find this in a whole family of languages like Haskell, for example. The reason I describe this now is because we're gonna start writing some types and I don't want it to look too weird, okay? We're gonna write a function, or I'm sorry, we're gonna define a model now. So. I'm going to say type alias model. So I'm making a new alias. You know what's an alias? You know what an alias is? So like my name's Murphy. My alias is floating socks. Floating socks. So if you say, socks. thank you, it refers to Murphy, right? So in type alias, we're assigning a new name to a description of a type that we can use throughout the app. So type alias model equals. Now our model is just going to be a string. That's all it is. Type alias model equal string. So we're saying we're gonna be able to use the word model in our code and wherever we use that, it's gonna mean that it's a string. And now we're gonna define a variable called model and it's going to equal an empty string. Everyone following along? Everyone cool? If not, just let me know. Yeah. We are importing startup. That's a great question. Uh, no, startup is a package, a third-party package, and I'll show you right here. In Elm package.json, there there are some tools called Elm Elm package Elm package. I think it's called right there. Elm package install, and if you go to elmlang dot or package package dot org. You can see a list of all the packages that are available for Elm, and there are a lot, really handy. And if you look for, oh, sorry. yeah, that's fine. What were you saying? Is there a package manager for Elm? That is exactly what Elm <laughs> package is. It's a package manager. Doesn't it's not called npm, which is too bad because npm is super cool. But if 
you want to install it, you could just say Elm package install evancz slash start dash app, and it'll install it for you and make it available to import just like we did. I'm glad you asked. So should we also run Elm as well? You, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, you shouldn't have to do that because Grunt should do it for you, okay. when, you when you run, when you save the file. Um, OK. What was the method again for installing a package? For installing a package, Elm package install. And there's also publish. But you're probably just going to need install. Um, all right, so we've got a model. Now we're lacking a uh, controller. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I did that. An update. We're lacking an update function. So, yes, Should Julia. The model be the type model? That is correct, too. So here's another cool thing Elm has type inference, which means it will statically analyze your app that you've written and flow the types through for you and alert you if it thinks you're doing something wrong. You don't always have to specify types. But it's a good practice, and it's Elm best practices to always specify types for things that are at the top level of indentation in your file, which, thanks for reminding me, Julia, is right here. So model is of type. That's what that colon means right there. We're typing model here. Model is of type model, being explicit about it. Um, now we want to make a, an update function. This is where it gets a little bit more confusing, but bear with me. Update, we're going to type it, takes an action. An action is a thing that is used by a start app, and it's kind of magic, but it's, oh, I'm sorry, an address. That's what I mean. An address is a thing that's kind of magic, but is provided to us and interacted with by start app. So we don't have to worry about address right now, other than the fact that we're going to use it. And we're going to use the address to send actions to. It's all going to be magic, and it's going to work just fine, because magic is infallible. Okay? Address, I'm going to reference here to make sure I'm doing it right. I'm doing it wrong. <clears throat> we'll fix that in a second, because that's actually the view, not the update. Update just takes an action, and it returns. Okay, this is kind of cool, too. The type notation we're about to use is the kind of type notation you'll find in Haskell. And it is that a function is described by something that gets passed in, like a parameter, and another something that gets passed in, like a parameter, and it returns something, like a type. And this is the thing that describes that function. So everything, all of the little arrows before the very last one, represent the parameters that the function accepts. The very last thing in the line represents the return value of the function. So this update takes an action, and it also takes a, a model, and it returns. Do you remember what the update function returns? What does the update function do? It takes in a model, changes it, and returns the model. Great. Take, returns another model. But you're going to say to me, Murphy, there's no such thing as an action yet. That's right. There is no such thing as an action yet. So we're going to make one. Type action equals. Now, this is kind of weird, but I'm just going to type a word, and it's going to become an action. That's part of how the types work. It still freaks me out, because I'm not defining it. I'm not like var foo. I'm just like type action equals update text. That's I was hoping to get something more <laughs> exciting than that. Update text. All right. Type action equals update text. This means that we have a new action called update text, and we can pass in the token update text to anything that expects an action, OK? In fact, we will be passing that in to our update function through an address. So update equals, oh, update. Here's where we pass it. Here's where we specify when we're actually defining the function what the parameters are that's coming in, all right? Update action equals, and now we're going to write a function. And I'm going to refer back to this because I um, don't remember. Update action model. That's what I did wrong. Update action model. These are two. Can I raise up the? Yes, you betcha I can. Update action model. Because we specified two parameters, right? Two parameters, not just one. I was forgetting the second one. Action and model. The update function takes an action and model. And we're going to then put a case statement in. Let's copy this in from the old code. Case statements can be very helpful. Basically, basically, we're going to make a huge switch statement that correlates to the actions that we have in our app. 
So all of the actions that the user can take or that can happen in our app are going to be specified right here as action types. And all of our reactions to those actions are going to be specified inside of the update function. So for every action, there is an equal and opposite update function. OK. Um, Exactly right. This no op that I had in there before should be update text. And what are we going to do? We're going to update our model, right? Uh, our model is an empty string right now. So update text actually takes a string. Whoa, what did I just do? Whoa, whoa. I just created an action type that takes a string. So like I created a type that has another type within it and associated with it. If that's not inception for you, I don't know what it is, but it is. So I'm going to pass in an action that has a string associated with it. So when I say case action of, I can specify the type update text and that it's going to give me a new string. New string. And then I'm going to say that everything that comes after this arrow is specifying the return value of this, of this case statement element. I don't have the good words for this yet. But what we're going to do is we're going to actually just return the new string. Because whatever the user types in to the dialog box, I want it to return that as the new model. Okay? I want it to update the model that way. So now we've got an action. All we need is a view. So let's uh, go ahead and specify the view. And the view, okay, here's the weird thing that I was trying to tell you earlier and messing up. View takes in an address. And you're going to say, where does an address come from? Well, we're going to find out in a second when the compiler tells us that we're dumb. View address action. So we're going to say, first thing the view takes in is an address that passes an action. You can't see, can you? There we go. First thing the view takes in is an address that also has an action, that, or an address that accepts actions, sends actions, right? Next thing, uh, or what it's going to return, what it's going to take in next is the model. Right there, model, and it's going to return HTML. Woo! Let's make sure I'm right and not dumb. Action, model, HTML. Great. So now we've got the type for our view. Let's make the view function. View equals, oops, no, I'm going to specify the arguments first to the function right here. View and address is the parameter name and uh, model, it's another parameter name, equals. Now, everything that comes after equals, it's going to be the return value, OK? Uh, this is kind of synonymous to saying function uh, address model, uh, in case you were lost. That's kind of what that looks like right there. And then everything that comes after the equal sign is, is the body of the function, similar to that idea, OK? so. Now we're going to specify some HTML to show to the user. We haven't imported the HTML libraries yet. I'm just going to start writing it, and then the compiler is going to tell us what we need to import. Okay? So I'm going to just stick in a div. Now the first argument to the div is an array of attributes, which we don't have. We're just going to make a normal empty div. Okay? And then we're going to pass in an array, a list of children. And these children are of type HTML, too. So there's a function that we'll, we will be importing from the HTML library called text. Type that in here. What that does is that takes a string and it turns it into an HTML string that Elm knows how to render to, to the uh, browser. So text, and then we got to say something. What are we going to say? Ma really? Is that all? <laughs> Come on. Someone say something. Oh, wait. I know what it was. Curly braces. No. Parens and fat arrows are the new curly braces and parent. I don't. That's really close. Parents are That's the new. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Curly braces and parents. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so now we should have some HTML to return. We're not doing anything with our address or our model yet, and that's fine. Okay. Not even actually uh, going to transform the data yet. So let's just start trying to compile this and see how it breaks. I've saved that. Saved that file right there. Now let's run npm start. OK, I've got my old page there, because the way I set it up, it doesn't try to compile until we've saved. So I'm going to save the file. Oh, 
Oh no. Look at all of these horrible warnings. They're not horrible though, they're actually very helpful. Okay? First thing, naming error. Can't find variable div. I give up. Let's go home. Everyone, that's it. This is the end. No, that's not it. We're going to go import div. And in fact, it's going to say like, well, maybe you want one of the following. It's going to try and suggest what I mean by div. And it's kind of close because it's like trying to do math stuff, but it's wrong because we're going to do HTML instead, all right? So we're going to say import HTML, which is a third-party library that we've downloaded and made available just like StartApp, okay? Import HTML exposing. Now that means that we're going to tell the HTML library to automatically take some of its children and import them into our current namespace. So exposing div. That means that we will be able to use div as a function just in our app. If we didn't do exposing div, we could just say import HTML. And down here, we could say HTML.div. But I don't want to do that because it's a little bit ugly. So exposing div. You can also do this, exposing dot dot, which imports everything. But I implore you, please don't do that. It makes it harder to read, and you run into have, you have name collisions and things like that. So exposing div. You can do it if you want to. Just I don't want to maintain the code afterward. All right, exposing div. Let's try compiling again and see what happens. Exposing div, it's gone. Sweet. Cannot find variable text. We've got to we've got to bring in text too. What else? Address. Let's skip that one for now. Cannot find type HTML. All right, we're gonna import HTML too. I think we got all the types except for address that it's missing. Yep. Yep. <coughs> Cannot find type address. Address is an type that comes from the signals library, which is built into Elm. We don't have to download that one. So import sig no dot add. Ooh, autocomplete. Oh, <laughs> that's great. All right. Could not find module signal dot address. That means I did something crazy. So let's go find out where address comes from. But before looking at our reference file, which we know works. Let's go and look at the package directory and see if we can find it. So if I go to Elm Core, and I'm going to search for core right here. Elmling Core. Address. Nope, nothing. Oh, there's signal. Oh, maybe address doesn't actually come from signal. Well, let's look through here. Actually, let's just give up and let's go look at the reference code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it should come from signal. And you know why? Because I don't do signal.address. I say import signal exposing address. Sorry. That's because address is a type. It's not a module. It's part of the signal module, OK? So import signal exposing address. Oh, OK. Why didn't you guys find that? Why didn't you tell me? I thought we were pair programming. All right. Hey, it compiled. Oh, does that mean it's going to run? That's a question. Let's go see. No, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. You know, oh, oh, cannot read property main of undefined. You know why this is? Let's go show you. In our HTML file, we bootstrap our Elm app. And we do that by saying elm, which is made available right here when we import our bundle, elm.embed, and we give it the module name, the main module name for our app. And we give it an ID or, or a, a DOM element to mount it into. And here, I'm expecting the app to be called app.main because it's stored in the folder app, and the module is main. But in here, I just called it main. So I actually have to specify that this is module app.main. And once I do that, Yay. thank you. Thank you very much. I'm here for another 20 minutes. And let's go make it interactive. OK. So far, all we've done is provide a view. Uh, we've made our model and stuff, but we're not actually really using it yet at all. So first step, let's do that. Let's actually take this text empty it out, and let's pass in the model instead. Let's actually use our model. So up here, where the model's initiated, we're going to say, I am a model. Are you? 
Vogue. Okay, save it. Oh, it worked. The model's now getting passed through the view. This is great. That means all we have left is to hook up the actions to modify the view. I guess we've got to add some inputs too so we can type stuff. Let's do that. Let's now add an input to the page. Either we can remember to import the types first, or we can just type stuff and have the compiler remind us to import stuff. But since we're here and we remember, let's go ahead and type stuff. So we're going to have an input. And we're going to need to add some attributes to this input. And those are found in HTML dot, can anyone guess? Attributes. Exposing, yeah. You, that's a great question. You could probably create your own because the source that is built in using, well, that Elm uses to interact with the DOM is freely <coughs> available and open source. So I'm sure that you can create your own. Um, but I have so far created my own by using theirs and building my own elements that actually just compose their elements. They've probably covered most of the ones you need, uh, which is most of the DOM. So we're going to do HTML attributes exposing type, because we're going to say input type equals text. Okay. So now that we have type available, our compiler is going to yell at us, because type is actually a keyword in the language. So it's not called type. It's called type small quote. I think it's called small quote type. I don't remember. The compiler will tell us anyway, so that's great. Okay. So now we've got a div. Let's throw into our div an input. Okay, this is super cool and pretty important. Don't use trailing commas because there's a new way and it's taken the world by storm. Not really, but whoever uses Elm, uh, Elm probably uh, likes it because it's the Elm standard way of doing it. So the first thing you put in your list in Elm goes right up there with the opening brace. We're going to put an input right there. Input type is text. And I don't remember if an input has children. I hope not. We'll see. And then on the next line, we're going to put our next child with a leading comma. And oh, no, I'm sorry. There. Yes, I can. There you go. See how beautifully these line up? It's just beautiful. It's just a joy to look at. Um, it might be a little bit harder to type, but I don't care. It's just gorgeous. So we're going to keep doing it that way. All right. So we've got an input with the type of text, and we've got the text for the model right below it. Let's give her a save and see what errors we have. Import HTML attributes exposing type. Oh, no. That means we did the wrong thing. And look, we put type down there instead of, instead of the right type. Let's go. This is what I wanted to do before. Let's go use the reference online to find out the type we really want to import. And we're going to search on the Elm packages for HTML. And we're going to go to, just going to keep searching until we find it. Elm HTML right there. OK, here are the references online. We're going to look for attributes. We're going to find type. Yep, type followed by a single quote character. OK, and you can see that type takes a string and it returns an attribute that can be passed in to an HTML or a function that takes attributes and returns HTML. OK. Let's do that. Type followed by a single quote. And up here, since I was doing crazy stuff, type followed by a single quote. Did you show the error? Right here? Yeah. Yes, but we'll look at it again. I am looking for one of the following things. Dot, dot, a value or type to expose. White space use, oh, or white space. It wanted one of those things, and we didn't give it any of those things. We gave it an opening quote, which was a syntax error. So we know that we're either looking for exposing dot dot, which I showed you earlier, looking for a value or a type, which is what we actually want to do, or white space. Thanks, Jameson. So we turned it into a type that's actual. And now our app compiles. Oh, let's go, let's go give her a look. Right there. Hey, hey, we have an input. But nothing happens. Nothing's happening in that input. All it's doing is sitting there on the page, lonely. OK, let's hook it up. But first, I'm just going to throw this in here because I didn't really have a good place to put it. 
One of the hardest times I have when learning a new language is figuring out the equivalent of console.log in that language, right? Because I'm like, I don't know how stuff's broken. How do I fix it? So I'm going to show you the equivalent of console.log. Now, Elm is a purely functional language, which means the functions that you define in Elm have no side effects. And I've heard it described as a side effecty function might be like add two numbers in JavaScript. You're like, have add. And you can pass in two numbers. J JavaScript's full of side effect -able things, which means that you could define a function that adds two numbers and launches a missile to destroy a small country. That's a side effecty function. It's like, OK, add. And it's like, whoa, what did that happen? I don't know. It's because it's side effecty. You don't know what's going to happen. But in Elm, you can't do anything inside of your function that doesn't affect the direct outcome of that function. You take stuff in, you put stuff out, and that's it. Yeah? How does that work exactly? Sorry? All right, so how does, it, how does it even work? That's a great question. I'm not entirely sure. But I trust the smart people who say that it's side effect free, which means that it's actually interacting with streams that are getting sent to the browser. Like there's, there's a whole paper on it. If you want to read it, awesome. I'm going to aspire to be able to understand it someday. Um, does that mean that when you're in a function, you can't access anything that wasn't passed into the function? Or how, how, does, how is that enforced in the code? That's a great question. I also don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. Because, and I'll tell you why. I was actually confused because I was able to access and, uh, and change models that weren't passed into the function. So when I was doing it, I was like, whatever, it's a purely functional language, my eye. But I do trust them. So probably I just wasn't understanding what was going on. But I love that question. Thank you. So if you write an infinite loop and it makes your, and it makes your CPU go up by one degree, is that a side effect? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. That's correct. So I guess we have proven them wrong. This is bunk. Everyone go home. Yeah. No, that is, that is technically a side effect. Good. Um, back to the lesson about side effecty and non-side effecty, which has now been proven null and void. Uh, we are going to introduce a side effecty function, which is, they say, like, the only, this is the side effecty function that we're going to use, and that's the debug.log function, which actually does a side effect of logging something to the console and doesn't just directly affect the outcome of the function, OK? Uh, and we're going to do that right here by saying let. Now, a let statement, you saw Dustin talking about let in ES6 defining a variable. It's similar in this. In this circumstance, we're going to define a variable, which would be available to use inside of the function body. But we're not actually going to use it. This is just a sneaky backdoor to be able to console log something, all right? So let foo. Uh, equal, I'm probably remembering this wrong, we'll see, debug.log model, or we'll give it some text to say model is, and then we'll pass in the model. And then in, I think that's the word we use to say what the body of it is. So let foo equals that in, and then you give it some expression to execute. All right, so this is the function body. This is a definition of a variable which we could use inside of the function body, but we're not because we're using it as a sneaky backdoor to get to the console log. See if it worked. Yes? It doesn't. It doesn't work. <laughs> Tell me why. Uh, we need to import it. Exactly. Debug? We need to import? Probably we need to do something about in, too. Let's see. Uh, import. Debug. I I thank, you for thank you for being the one true pair programmer I have in this room. OK. <laughs> Import debug. What did it say? <coughs> oh, I guess it worked when we imported debug. Did it? Now it did. Let's see if it really worked, though. <laughs> oh my goodness, look! The model! It's there! You are now fully capable of writing an L map and debugging it, too! Give yourselves a hand! Yeah! Yeah! Great. All right, stop, because you haven't really actually made an app yet. So, we got to update the string, right? we got to update this thing. So now, oh, this gets a little bit more intimidating. Yeah. And I'm, we're going to need to reference some code, I'm probably too, because I never remember how to do this unless I'm referencing stuff, which is OK, because referencing stuff is important, right? Yes? I want to run this. What will do on the terminal I install Gruntly? You, uh, oh, Grunt, npm install dash g, Grunt dash cli. Well, I did that. You did that, and then? NPM start, I think. 
Okay, good. Great. All right. Okay, so now we need to set an on change event for this input, right? And with that on change event, when it changes, we're going to, what are we going to do? Anyone remember? We're going to reverse the string. How are we going to do it? Are we going to mutate the model? No. no. We're going to fire off an signal, which is of type action. Good, good. Which goes to the address, which then gets passed into the update, update function. You follow along? This is really simple, right? This is not, a, not at all complicated. And then the update function takes in the model and the action, and it changes the model, which it then returns, which goes back into the view. Very good. That is a unidirectional data flow for you. If I haven't seen one, wait, that doesn't work. I don't know what I was going to say there. OK. Input type is text. Now we're going to give it, let's go see what attributes we have available to us inside of Elm HTML. How am I doing on time, Jameson? We're almost done. We didn't have a hard end date. Ten, ten minutes? Okay. If you're bored, leave. If you're not, don't. I'm going to try to end pretty soon here, okay? I didn't mean, that sounded rude. I mean, if you're bored, you're welcome to get up and leave. I won't be offended. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> get out. Okay. HTML attributes. Let's look through here to see what we have. I don't know if you can read it. Um, well, special attributes. Oh, we don't want attributes. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for events. Like rock concerts, events. OK, focus helpers. On blur, on focus, on submit. Not interested in any of those. On key up, not really interested in that. On click, no, no, no. OK, on, that could be helpful. Well, maybe that's what we want. Target value, OK. <coughs> I guess what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to build up our own on, on change event by building it with on and building it with target value. This is scary, because every time I come into this piece of code, I'm like, how did I do it again? Because I've only written like two things with this, you guys. I've only written like two apps. So this is scary. But you're here with me, and we're pair programming, so it's going to be fine. Yeah? Out of curiosity, why did you guys choose to talk about Oh, just because I'm excited about it. And Jameson is like, does anyone want to talk? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> Captive audience! My wife doesn't really care about it, so I'm glad you guys do. Okay. <laughs> you people, you friends, not you guys. We're not all guys, I'm sorry. Okay. So on. On takes a string. That's its first argument. Baby steps. On uh, change. You know what the event is for? Is it on change? Input. Thank you. On input. Okay, so this is going to specify that we're going to have a new event listener for this uh, element. And then we're going to pass in a decoder. OK, I think that decoder is going to be target value. That sounds good, right? Target value. Target value. But what does target value take? Target value takes a decoder string, right? Decoder A, or is it? Is it a decoder? It is a decoder string. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so what target value does, on input, oh, here's an example. Great. And I get to teach you some new syntax. I'm going to scroll up for you people who can't see behind my monitor. Target value, and then this right here, backslash stir arrow function, that's a lambda also known as, in JavaScript land, an anonymous function. Have you ever heard of an anonymous function before? That's what that is, also known as a lambda in many other languages. We define an, a function here that has no name, which is serving essentially as a callback. That's what this is. This is equivalent to you in JavaScript saying, on event, blah, 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 and then passing in a callback. Okay. So what we're saying is target value takes a function which it will pass into a string, and then we'll do something with that string. So backslash stir means this is an anonymous function with one argument, which we're going to call stir string. And then the body of the function is what comes afterwards. So let's get that far. Okay, Target value, we're going to say uh, backslash stir, because that's what we're getting in. 
uh, an arrow, because that's appropriate. And then what? Then what comes next? All right, signal out message. This is the part of the language that I still don't, I mean, I haven't gotten to understanding these parts yet. So this is where I just close my eyes. I'm like, yep, yeah, that's what the docs say to do, so I'm going to do it. So that's what we're going to do, all right? It's a great way to learn stuff. Just glaze over the things you don't understand. So signal.message, going to paste it in right there. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, and then we're going to pass it an address, I think. Meh. We'll see. If it's wrong, the compiler will tell us. That's part of what's so wonderful about this. <laughs> we we absolutely do. Thank you. We will get that in just a minute when we finish this line. And then we're going to pass in, okay, in parens, there's something right here. This is specifying the order of operations here because it can become ambiguous. We're using these parens that says content to value stir. Uh, to specify that we're going to call content to value the function and pass in this value of stir. Okay, I don't know what content to value is. Oh, it's what comes in. Yep. It's. I think that you're right. You don't need to I think I think you're totally right. So let's try that out. And you know why? This is great. Let's go look at our types. Here for address stir, we don't want that. You're, I, yes, OK. So address stir, what we're doing there is we're not actually calling a function. Address, remember, right here, address is of type address action. So I think that we are going to have to actually pass in to address a, an action here. Uh, but the compiler will tell us once again. Should I run it in the compiler and see what's wrong? I think I know what's wrong. Should I just do it or should I run it? What do you want to see? Run it. Run it. OK, let's see, let's see it explode or if it explodes. First, we'll import the signal.message right up here. Import ex exposing address and message, OK? So down here, signal.message. We're going to change that to just message. All right, changed. It's done. Oh, compiler errors. Cannot find variable target value. It's because we have to go up to events. Oh, we haven't even imported them yet. That's why. Import HTML dot events. Good. Exposing, uh, what was it called? Target value. target value. Thank you. Yeah. So you hold information in the model, and you get information from where you're writing. Do you uh, consider it to send out like Ajax request to the server or something? Yes, so that, that is. Or if you're going to do it with like Bob Those are great questions, and that is the next level of understanding that I have not yet reached. Oh. I invite you to talk to the guru upstairs. I don't know, you, you've probably done that, Jameson. Jameson's no. done this more than I have. No, I'm, I, think, I think we're even now. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> not in ping pong, though. He owns me in ping pong every time. It will never be equal. Um, the docs talk about that, involves signals and interrupt with JavaScript. I don't understand it yet. I'm okay. sorry I can't answer your, answer your question. Getting there, though. All right. So we imported some stuff. Cannot find variable on. That's because we haven't imported on yet, which is from events. Let's try that. Cannot find variable message. Thank you. That's very helpful. Right there. OK, all right. Oh, what? It's lowercase m. You just imported it as capital M. Oh. Multiple cursors. Yes. Thank you. OK, great. Type annotation for view does not match its definition. View, address, action, model, HTML. Is this a little bit confusing or what? As I infer the types of values flowing through your program, I see a conflict between these two types. Action and string. That means that it's expecting an action to be passed in, and it's getting a string instead. Now, this, this actual me error message is not as helpful as I hoped it would be. I hoped it would point us to right here. 
Because what I think is going on is you see that we're trying to pass a string to this address. And if you look back at the definition of the view, we're saying that the address takes actions only. And a string isn't an action. So we have to build an action, right? But that's easy to do because up here, we've got type action is update text string, which takes a string. So let's just pass in update text. Message, address, update text, string. So now we've built, with these two words right here, we've built an action that's update text with an associated string, which it just happens to be the new text from the input field. We're passing that to an address, which we're then giving to a message, which is all in a callback, which gets sent to on input, which gets called by target value. Straightforward. Maybe. Maybe not so straightforward. Not that bad, though. All right, what did we do wrong? Uh, thank you. Right here, right? Oops, I keep clicking the wrong thing. Right here? Seems right to me. Oh, huh. huh. it worked. It worked. Did it work? Let's cut time. We won't get ready. Ah! Ah! Yeah, it worked. Woo! Uh oh, it doesn't reverse. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Oh, but we can take out our console log because we don't need it anymore because we're brilliant. So now we've just got to reverse the string before it comes out. Well, welcome to the easy world of functional programming, my friends. Let's just go look for reverse inside of our core library. Let's see if it exists already. So we're going to go into core, Elmlang core, and we're going to search for reverse. String reverse. Could our work be any easier? <laughs> this is the easiest job in the world. Let's import, import string. And then down here where we pass text model, string dot reverse. Oh, almost, almost did a thing there. Almost passed into the thing. I'm gonna surround this in parens so that we know we're calling a function before we pass the result to text. <gasps> See if it worked, huh? It appears to have worked. I am, oh wait, you go V? Oi, era la dum ama oh. I could be in Lord of the Rings. I could be in Lord of the Rings. Can I get some applause? Thank you, thank you. All right, that's it. Questions? I probably can't answer them, but. Do what? Back to the code. That code. Sorry if I move too fast to actually follow along. Any other questions? Can you post the, the code on GitHub so people can look at it? Absolutely. The, 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 the stuff we did. What do you want? Stuff, this, this code? I think this would be helpful. Great. I will be glad to post this to GitHub. Great. There's, I think you made an Elm chat room on the Utah JS Slack. Right? So I did. If you want to come join us talking, go sign up for Slack utahjavascript.com and then oops and then join the room fun channel uh, yep <laughs> good join us there and we can chat thanks everybody